Good evening, and welcome to a discussion with theologian Kristen D.D. Johnson about politics in a divided age, engaging with justice and love. Our focus for this year's Christ at the Core Fall series is the pressing question of how do we flourish in uncertain times? It's a privilege to learn from Dr. Kristen D.D. Johnson about how we can live out our calling as disciples of Jesus during such polarized and difficult circumstances. Kristen D.D. Johnson is Dean and Vice President of Academic Affairs and Professor of Theology and Christian Formation at Western Theological Seminary in Holland, Michigan. In partnership with International Justice, Justice Mission, she and co-author Bethany Hanke Wong wrote the award-winning The Justice Calling, Where Passion Meets Perseverance. Dr. Johnson's scholarship focuses on theology, culture formation, and political theory. Other publications include Theology, Political Theory, and Pluralism, Beyond Tolerance and Difference. In 2018, she was named one of 10 new or lesser known female theologians worth knowing by Christianity Today. Dr. Johnson will share some thoughts with us, and then we will transition to a brief conversation with Dr. Amy Black and Dr. Gregory Lee. Dr. Black is a professor of political science here at Wheaton College, and she assigns Dr. Johnson's work in her first year seminar, which asks the question, can politics be civil? Dr. Black's research interests include religion, politics, and fostering civil dialogue. Dr. Lee is associate professor of theology and urban studies and senior fellow of the Wheaton Center for Early Christian Studies. Dr. Lee's research interests include, what can we learn from the theology of Augustine as we live and engage our modern context? Welcome, Dr. Johnson, and thank you for joining us and helping us consider what it means to live faithfully in such polarized and conflictual times. Thank you for having me. It is a privilege to be here. These are difficult topics to engage, difficult times to navigate, and I'm really grateful that we have this opportunity, this time together to wrestle with the nature of this moment in our culture, American culture, as well as how we as Christians want to inhabit this moment. What is our calling in this time? As I've spent the last couple decades reflecting on these questions, I've come to really land on Psalm 1 be like trees, as helpful for us to think about our calling. There are lots of verses that Christians have looked to to think about their political engagement. And I wanna offer be like trees as a framework for us. I'll say a bit more about that over the course of our time together. I also wanna mention that one of the reasons I'm really excited to connect with you all is because so many of my questions that I've been asking go back to the season of life that you who are first year students are in. I became a Christian in my high school years and started asking questions like, what does God want me to do with my life for the first time? Living outside of Washington, DC, I thought maybe politics and I ventured onto Capitol Hill to explore that. And what I encountered there was and a surprising level of animosity, um, a sense of, kind of anger and resentment and fear that though I had studied politics, I hadn't encountered. And it was at that time, a real surprise. Now we've seen that trickle down and it's part of, of our everyday reality. But at the time, I really had a lot of questions when I encountered that and wondered, what, what is this? How do I make sense of this? What does this mean about our political and collective life? And thankfully, being a student, a college student, I was able to go back and really benefit from the liberal arts and ask professors and grapple with these questions. And particularly found one professor who had just written a book called Culture Wars that gave me some categories to make sense of what I'd experienced. At the same time, as a, a newish Christian, I was asking a lot of questions about discipleship and what does it mean to follow Jesus faithfully? And those two lines have really coalesced within my own life and story and academic calling. So that a lot of the questions I ask come down to, how do we follow Jesus faithfully in complex political and cultural times? So I hope we can explore that question together during our time. Now, one piece about my story that was interesting that when I, when I entered into, into that political arena, 
I recognized that I really hadn't done a lot of work yet as a Christian to think about my beliefs and convictions, political beliefs and convictions as a Christian. And I also was grateful for those undergraduate years and the liberal arts to help me wrestle with some of those questions. And for you, I hope that's the same. Your story may match mine, or perhaps you grew up in a Christian home with a lot of thoughts about politics. This is still an opportunity, a great time for you to be able to wrestle, to ask questions, to think about how your faith intersects with your political convictions. And I hope that your courses and your professors can be really helpful pieces of that wrestling and, and discovery for you. One thing that I find really helpful as we think about this intersection of faith and politics is remembering that we are not the first Christians to wrestle with these questions. One of the gifts of being a Christian is that we're part of the great cloud of witnesses as we read in Hebrews. I sometimes think of relay race imagery that, that we have been entrusted with, with the baton, with the race. Uh, we run the race as Paul says, but we also are not the first to run it. So I wanna I wanted take a moment to look back and remind ourselves that Christians have been, have been asking questions about the intersection of faith and politics really from the beginning. Uh, if we start with the New Testament, we find Paul writing words like, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He also reflects on government in Romans 13, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. And the authorities that exist have been established by God. So we have this sense of a kingdom of heaven and these political realities that we're a part of and that we're to be subject to. And at the same time in Acts, we see Peter and the other apostles struggling and they say, hey, we must obey God rather than human beings. So there's a complexity um, to how we inhabit these earthly realities in light of our faith and our obedience to God and our citizenship in the kingdom of God. And Christians have been wrestling with this for a long time. The earliest Christians, of course, were living under the Roman Empire. And for them, the Roman Empire was considered supreme not only in politics, but also religion. And emperors, Caesars, could be worshipped. And, and the waves of persecution um, are connected to that, right, that Christians experienced. So for the earliest Christians, they couldn't have imagined a political reality that really reflected their faith. They put a lot of emphasis on Christ the King and hope in Christ's return and really lived in a, in a spirit of martyrdom. Things shifted quite a bit in the 300s when Constantine, as the story goes, had a, a dramatic conversion, saw a vision during a battle of the cross and God promising him that he would win this battle and he did. And with that conversion came not Christianity becoming the established religion of the Roman Empire, but a shift, a time when there was no longer such hostility towards Christianity. And eventually Christianity does become the official religion of the Roman Empire. And really what happened then starting in the 300s was you could say 1500 years of wrestling with the relationship between what we now call church and state. As different political rulers intersected with religious authorities and bishops and popes and kings and emperors all trying to figure out how, how does this work? How do these fit together? And then the reformation happens and things get more complex in the European setting. And then eventually the American experiment. I think it's important to remember that it is an experiment and we're still living in that experiment. It, the United States represents the first deliberate attempt to create a political society in which no religion has an official role, no established church or religion. And that, that was a new thing. And yet, even in the midst of that, there were a lot of questions about the relationship between Christianity and politics. The U U.S. states were overwhelmingly Protestant. There were things like laws prohibiting atheism and religious tests for office holders um, so before they could be deemed acceptable to hold an office. So though there was not an established religion, there was a, there was a lot of intermingling. I do follow scholars who 
um, and historians who believe that America was not an overtly Christian nation at its founding, even as I recognize this sort of complex intermingling. So the US context, that's what we're going to focus on in our time here. It was founded as an experiment in the 1800s. It was a time of real religious awakening and revival. And that led to a, a sort of evangelical Protestant consensus that shaped, um, shaped things on the ground. And all of these things I'm naming are mere brushstrokes. I hope that through your coursework, you can go a lot deeper into all of these dynamics that I'm naming. By the end of the 1800s and into the early, early 1900s, things started to shift. There was a time of tremendous change. Uh, we were moving from an agrarian society to an industrialized society, shifts from farms to cities, the rise of urbanization and a lot of new social challenges. And at the same time, there were a lot of intellectual challenges coming over from Europe raising big questions about things like, is the Bible really the word of God? And uh, was Jesus really raised from the dead? It was a lot, of, a lot of turmoil. And you've probably heard of this time period because it ushered in what people refer to as the modernist fundamentalist divide. White Protestant Christians kind of divided, generalizations are always tricky, but divided into two main postures, you could say. For the modernists, the idea was Christian faith needs to adjust and adapt. Modern life has shifted. Things have changed. Doctrines can change. Let's, let's follow that. And fundamentalists ended up saying, hey, there are some fundamental pieces to our faith that are really significant, and they're being challenged. And we really believe we need to hunker down and hold fast to these core doctrines. And that ushered in a season that historians refer to as a, a time of withdrawal for a lot of traditional Christians. They stepped back from public life, from, from mainstream institutional life, and from their political and cultural engagement. And there was a sense of a posture of, of embattlement um, in, that, in the midst of that. So fast forward to the 1940s, and I think all this history really helps us make sense of, of the times we're living in today. So in the 1940s, some more traditional Christians started saying, hey, I wonder if it's time to reevaluate uh, this, this engagement or lack of engagement. So someone like Carl Henry becomes a Christian, ends up at Wheaton as a student. And he looks back at the long tradition of Christianity and says, hey, you know, Christians have actually always been engaged in culture and public life and politics. And, and we're not doing that right now. Is it time to end the season of what he called cultural hibernation and re-engage? And can we do that differently? Can we have a different posture? He, he encouraged engagement and persuasion rather than confrontation. And people like Billy Graham, also of Wheaton, uh, represented sort of the public face of that, a different mode of engagement. Organizations emerged, Christianity Today was developed to really try to support this mode of re-engagement. And out of that, you see things like uh, World Relief, the National Association of Evangelicalism, trying to move towards more and more cultural engagement with politics as one piece of that. In the 1970s and 80s, what we see is a more overtly political re-engagement. And I think on, on the one hand, that is an outgrowth of that call to re-engagement, and it had a slightly different flavor. It maybe, it, it, it maybe went more back to those original fundamentalist roots, a, a sense that, um, that Though we thought things had really shifted in the 1920s and that was disorienting and we, we withdrew, now because of things going on, we really think things have shifted a lot. So a phrase like the moral majority was trying to capture that, that there's a majority of us and though we've been silent, we actually really object to some of what we're seeing going on. And there are different narratives about, about what motivated that. Um, some have looked to Roe v. Wade Others have said, actually, it may have more to do with race and the loss of tax exempt status for segregated schools. So again, through your coursework, I hope you can look more deeply at, at that season. I think in the broad 
broad brush strokes approach we want to say there was there was a re political reengagement and there was a bit of a, a defensiveness to that reengagement a sense that the culture is under attack that we're not being represented in an us against them mentality and and they were right there there were really significant differences in culture and that's what I encountered when I walked into Capitol Hill in the early 90s, this sense of, of division and a sense of, of kind of fear and, and sort of anger marking those divisions. And the terminology of culture wars helped to make sense of that. James Davison Hunter, who I was able to encounter in my undergrad days, borrowed this term from the German to try to make sense of the conflict we were seeing in the US. At the time, there were kind of surprising political conflicts emerging over things like funding for the arts. People were asking, why is this ending up being such a controversial thing? What art, what art should be funded? And prior to this time, people, when they tried to make sense of uh, political or cultural conflict, they tended to look at things like economic differences to make sense of them or religious differences. And Hunter said, I actually think there's more of a of a difference around some of these deep, deep, deep layers, if we go down, really different notions of moral authority, of truth, of how we know, how we believe we, we learn what is true and right, the nature of what it means to be human, which then lead to different understandings of things like art and the purpose of education and what is the family, what are what is marriage. And there are these really deep differences for some, there's a commitment to an authority that is outside of us, something um, external to which we believe we're, we're called to conform. As Christians, we believe that it's God and then what we receive in the Bible um, as sources of that external authority. For others, what you could, what you could, and what Hunter terms, you know, progressives, truth is an ever unfolding reality and we should reshape our received traditions to get in line with that. And you can see some overlap there with the modernist fundamentalist divide. So some of these divisions go oh, a lot further back and they've gotten maybe deeper and deeper as time has gone on until we're at the point where we find ourselves today as Tim Keller and John Anazu put it in a book, Uncommon Ground that I contributed to recently. We find ourselves with the deep and irresolvable differences over the things that matter most, all held within one political society. So that is part of our landscape and part of our reality. And it's part of what we're experiencing all around us. Combined with that, I want to add that we have kind of given politics more and more um, kind of weight and emphasis within our political life. James Hunter in his more recent work um, talks a lot about this, that politics has, has in many ways become our predominant way of understanding culture. And Christians in some senses overall, white Christians in particular, um, bought into that in the 70s and 80s and put more and more weight on political engagement, perhaps over some other forms of cultural engagement that would have been available to us. So we have an, an increasing emphasis on politics. And then we also have some shifts in our mode of political engagement overall. And here Hunter uses language that he actually draws from Friedrich Nietzsche, concepts like will to power and resentment, this idea that um, what we're experiencing is like a competition among factions and what we need to do is win so that it becomes easier to think about forcing your will through legal and political means rather than persuading, negotiating or compromising. And what fuels a lot of political participation and what people use to motivate others to join in are these narratives of resentment, um, narratives of, of um, rage and revenge, a sense of embitteredness that, that our side is disenfranchised and we are being targeted or persecuted or we're not being represented. And those are used to kind of motivate political engagement and, and really inculcate that sort of warrior mentality. So in the midst of all of that, we as Christians are asking, what, what is our mode of engagement? What does it mean to think about kind of the Christian way in this divided time? How do we engage with justice and love? I think it's important to take a moment 
to reflect on the state of our of our Christian witness now. And by our, I should clarify that I, I, I'm thinking mostly at this point of kind of probably white evangelical Christian witness. What is it that that we are known for at this point in, in our culture's moment? Hunter suggests with, with so much politicization that has gone on, um, there has been an accommodation to the spirit of the age that has made politics the dominant witness of the white church to the world. And, and what has been the content of that witness? And others are asking these questions too. One political scientist says, our reputation is really for stridency, for being defensive and combativeness and asking questions about whether we're undermining our own witness. We focused on issues and what, what issues we sense we're called to engage with, but we've put a lot less attention on the character of our engagement, how we engage with those issues. And some of your Wheaton professors have been wrestling with this as well. Isa Macaulay, New Testament professor recently said, I will see stuff out there and I'll say, well, I agree with that. And sure, everything you said was true, but the collective weight of the way you say it drips with animus that I think sometimes pushes up against the bonds of Christian charity. Amy Black, political scientist who we'll get a chance to engage with a little bit later here, has written a lot about this and said, you know, politics and government are important, but the most important Christian calling is to love God and follow him. And if we go back to Augustine, he says, anyone who thinks that he has understood the divine scriptures or any part of them, but cannot by his understanding build up this double love of God and neighbor, has not yet succeeded in understanding them. Are we living out this call to love God and love neighbor through our political witness right now? Caitlin Scheiss, who grew up in fundamentalist evangelical circles, is also asking these questions as a 20-something right now. And she really is saying, I'm just not sure the culture war approach is appealing to younger Christians. And furthermore, I think we want to ask not just pragmatically what's appealing, but what is faithful? Jesus says, by, the, by their fruit, you shall know them. And Paul fleshes that out in terms of the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are supposed to be the markings of God's people in Christ. Amy Black reminds us that 1 Corinthians 13 applies to all of us as Christians all of the time, including in our political engagement. So I want to take a moment to read a part of 1 Corinthians 13, this famous passage on love, and ask us to reflect on kind of our witness and if we think it does reflect this calling here, this call to love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always hopes, always trusts, always perseveres. This is the kind of love that we're called to. And I believe as Christians that we can engage politically and not compromise our convictions and do so in ways that reflect these kinds of biblical callings on our lives. Some of, some of the resources that I have drawn on that I want to share with you to help me think about that come from the past. As I said earlier, it's such a gift that we're not the first Christians, that we're part of this great cloud and we get to look back to those who've gone before us. And one of the people that has really been helpful in shaping in my thinking is Augustine of Hippo. I entered into my graduate studies in theology with a lot of deep concerns about the state of our political life and really not sure if we had the resources to sustain our life together. And over the course of my studies and in walking through Augustine, I was able to emerge with a framework of hope that was more prominent than the despair and the fears that I carried with me. In part, simply thinking more about our history that 
Augustine, for example, became a Christian in 386. And then Rome falls in 410. That was so significant. There was so much turmoil, so many different ways of life and religious perspectives already on the ground. And then political and cultural turmoil. Rome was a very symbolic place. It, it represented not only political power, but religious power um, prior to Christianity. But then once, once Rome became a, a Christian in an official name, when it fell, it raised huge questions for Christians. Some of, and a lot of people were blaming Christians for the fall. And Augustine enters into that mix and writes his city of God to navigate all of those questions. And he draws from scripture some really important categories. Going back to verses like Philippians that we read earlier, there are two cities. There is the city of God and the city of man or the heavenly city or the earthly city. And our primary citizenship is to be found in the city of God. That is the source of our primary allegiance and also of our hope because we can remember that Christ is king of that city. No matter what we see going around us, going on around us, Christ is king. This is echoed, of course, in the book of Revelation, which was written to Christians navigating a lot of political turmoil and suffering. And through John, God reminds them, though it might not be evident around you, Jesus is the lamb on the throne and Jesus is reigning. And to be able to remember that no matter what the turmoil around us is really significant. Augustine also does a lot with the language of pilgrim. This pilgrim reminder that we're not, we're not fully at home here. We're on a pilgrimage. And yet we are here. Uh, we are each placed in particular locations and, and that include political realities. And so what is our calling as we remember our primary citizenship and as we put our hope in Jesus Christ, not the political realities around us, um, what's our calling here and now? And here he turns to Jeremiah 29. The people of God are in exile. They've been put to Babylon. The place around them does not reflect them. What are they to do? And through the words of Jeremiah, God encourages his people to build houses and plant gardens and ultimately seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, you will find welfare. The word welfare there comes from the Hebrew shalom. Seek the shalom of the places where you have been sent even though they may not reflect you. So how does this language of exile or pilgrimage, how can that shape us here and now? What does it look like for us to seek shalom, to seek flourishing life, to seek God's vision for flourishing life in a political time, in a cultural context that's very complex as our ancestors in the faith did so long ago? I think one, one moving, moving to the contemporary, one thing that can help us as we think about inhabiting this space faithfully is encouraging us to take time to learn each other's stories and like complexify the stories that we're both receiving and telling. Social psychologists like Jonathan Haidt have done a lot to help us understand how we make moral decisions. And, and we like to think that we're doing a lot of reasoning and developing our convictions, but, but what, what he and others are, are showing is that we actually often already have a way of seeing the world and often already have convictions. And we, and we fit what we're receiving into those received narratives, those narratives that we already have. We gravitate towards stories, he writes, that align with our current ways of seeing the world. That's our default setting. And Lecrae, African-American hip hop artist, sort of picks up on this theme of storytelling and says, we create narratives. That's how we make sense of the world and make sense of events in the world. And right now we're receiving a lot of stories that are, that are making sense of the world. And, and they're often overly simplistic. There are there are heroes and there are villains being named. And depending on your perspective, different heroes and different villains. And, and Lecrae in, in one piece of writing goes into that in relation to Ferguson, Missouri, and the, the conflict between 
police officers and African Americans and, and how we understand the deaths um, that we're encountering and the stories that we tell and the categories we use and who's the hero and who's the villain in those stories. And he pushes us to ask, are these too simplistic? And as Christians, we should be able to complexify those stories because we know that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God as we learn in Romans and that we all need Jesus. And furthermore, that Jesus is the true hero. There are no neat heroes outside of Jesus Christ who has come to save and overcome sin and who will come again to fully redeem everything. And in the meanwhile, continues to be at work in the world. So can we complexify the stories that we're receiving? If, our, if the sources we're consulting give us neat and tidy sources, what's our responsibility as Christians to try to complexify those and understand the nuances? And how can we go about doing that together? And how can our education and our coursework while students help us in that? And our engagement outside of the classroom as we read novels, watch movies and documentaries, how can we enter into other people's stories and maybe appreciate perspectives differently than we might naturally or by default gravitate towards? I also think it's important to remember that we really ought to expect disagreement. Things are more complex, as I was just saying, and we will encounter disagreement. That has been the history. Um, of Christianity, of political realities. So expect disagreement. And when you encounter it, try to be intentional about going deeper. Historically, it may be helpful to remember that Christians were not presumed to be all of one party until pretty recently in our history. If you go back and look at even Republican and Democrat and how whites and blacks have inhabited those identities, even in the last few decades, it's not a straightforward story. And the ways that we've been shaped in the last couple of, well, since 70s, 80s as, as white Christians does not reflect even the longer history in our own country. And we have a lot to learn as white Christians from black Christians and Latino and Latina Christians who hold together uh, a lot of complexity in how they inhabit their doctrines and their faith and how that intersects with their social and political engagement. So it's a, it's a more complex picture and, and not to be afraid of that complexity, but to remember that as we learn from Colossians, in Christ, all things hold together. We don't have to be afraid of the disagreements and the differences. Can we learn from them? And can we trust that in Christ, they hold together? And when you encounter those areas of disagreement, when you encounter anger in others, can you go deeper? Can you pause and ask, wow, what's behind that anger? As, as the Colossian Way, which is a, a ministry that supports Christians in navigating conflict, has said, encouraged us, us to ask, what's the fear beneath the anger that we see or are experiencing ourselves? And then what's the love behind that fear? What's at stake? What's, what's the positive thing that, that you're afraid of losing, that a cultural shift is impacting, that this moment is bringing out in you or another? How do we get to the positive loves? And will that help us have more compassion and understanding? So what's the, what's the fear beneath the anger that we might be seeing? And then what's the love beneath the fear? Can we take the time to ask those questions both in ourselves and in others? And as we move towards the end of our time together, I want to say it's also important to keep politics in its place and remember why government exists. Politics is important, but it's not everything. And as, it, as I said earlier, it's become more and more prominent in our collective life together in the U.S. context. And we really want to avoid politics becoming an idol, thinking that that's going to be the way to restore culture or society, forgetting that Christ is king and that's our bigger framework. There are different Christian understandings of why government exists. Some view it as a pre-fall reality that we, that we were designed to live together together 
And that even if there wasn't a fall, we would have needed ways to organize our collective life. We would have needed sources of authority and ways to seek common goods together. Others view it more as a post-fall reality that because of sin, we need politics to restrain evil and enable some level of justice to reign in our lives together. But I think in either way, politics is not everything. It's one part of our life together. So if we go back to creation and we say, why did God create this world? And what is the vision that shapes that? There's that word shalom can be really helpful that we heard in Jeremiah. Shalom is what biblical scholars and theologians um, often point to as um, God's vision of wholeness, a flourishing life, a vision of all of creation, humans, the created world, and God living together in mutual harmony, justice, and delight. That that was what God wanted, this vision of abundant, flourishing life. And that Christians, well, I shouldn't say Christians at, in the, at that point, the, the first man and the first woman were given a particular role to play. Um, they were given dominion, right? That is a, that's a political word. They were given authority, God's authority, and asked to steward the world with that, to seek flourishing, to seek justice, to seek love, to put love into action through their care of the world. So political life is one piece of that, but it's a much bigger vision of flourishing life. And that's where I think that tree imagery can be so helpful. Be like trees. What do trees do? They take in toxic air, they take in carbon dioxide and they offer life-giving oxygen. They provide beauty, they provide shade, food, sustenance, nourishment. They play such an important role and they're rooted in a particular time and place. So what does it mean for us to think about our Christian engagement as this calling to be like trees, to be attentive to the places around us where, where people are not flourishing, where structures are not flourishing, and to, to discern what is the life that we can offer? How can we connect and, and, and exhibit the fruit of the Spirit as we do that? And connect to passages like those from Revelation, the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations, that this is part of our calling as Christians, to be like trees. And from those deep roots in Christ that nourish us, and that by God's grace enable us to be rooted in a time and place and engage um, locally and think about with kingdom vision, um, about how we can contribute to the shalom of that place. We also can develop wide branches. And from those wide branches, can we overlap, find places of overlap with those who are different, who might have their own very different deep roots, but can we find those places of overlap and work together towards common causes so that we don't have to be fearful of those differences, but we're rooted in our identity in Christ. We're confident in our hope in Christ the King, and we're able to seek seek the welfare of the city right where we are, overlapping with others as we do so. These are some of, of my reflections today as we think about what it means to live with justice and love in a complicated and divided political time. Thank you so much for your comments, Kristen. This was such a great overview a historical overview and a theological deep dive. And I, I think this has been super helpful for us. Um, Greg and I would like to sort of ask you some questions to sort of continue this dialogue. Thought maybe I'd start kind of with that, that tree imagery that you offered us. As you know, politics is, is a great form of engagement, but it's not our only form of engagement. So what would you suggest as we wanna be like trees, what could be some other forms of cultural engagement that we as Christians should be involved in to create this shalom you've been talking about? Mm -hmm. I appreciate that question. Thank you, Amy. You know, one thing that Hunter pushed me to think about was the degree to which Christians have looked to politics as the way of, of changing the world or changing culture. And as a sociologist, he's asking, is that really how culture changes? So I don't want it to diminish the importance of the law. There have been laws that have been so significant and really had an impact. And yet 
I guess I'd ask us to think about in our own lives, what, what do we think has really shaped and changed us? Um, the novels that we've read that shaped our imaginations, maybe, maybe Harry Potter, right? Or the movies or um, the music, that there are all these other ways that we are shaped as cultural beings and that thinking as Christians about kind of flourishing life from a range of callings, through a range of callings, um, really is significant. I just, just last night was reading about a, a lawyer who said, you know, I, I thought I was called to law, but I actually had the side passion in film. And I'm realizing that there's a lot I can do to bring awareness and shape people's imaginations through storytelling and through film that maybe goes, goes right alongside my advocacy through law. So I really encourage, as I think about discipleship, kind of being attentive to the gifts and passions that, that you have and the formation that you have in those. And then right where you are thinking about where the gaps are and, and from right within whatever your calling is from, from soccer mom to artist uh, to gardener. I mean, I think what it takes for a place to thrive has so many different layers to it that require beauty and collective life like sports and um, in kind of e ecosystems that work well together, that there are ways that we can all contribute from with, with in our callings if we have the eyes to see and are attentive to where the gaps are and think creatively about how we might contribute. Thanks so, so much, Kristen. This has been a really nourishing and um, almost restorative and healing talk. I think that the world would be a better place if students just didn't go on social media for 35 minutes and just watch their talk instead. Um, I want to continue with that question. Um, so what sorts of practices do you think that Christians and especially younger Christians can develop to avoid being part of the problem, to avoid falling into patterns of polarization? And I'd especially be curious to hear more of your thoughts about place. You talked about being rooted in time and place, being attentive to your surroundings. Could you speak a little bit more about the importance of location and place as we develop um, healthier political practices? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, those are rich questions as well. On the practices side, I, I do think Christians are increasingly aware of how much we're shaped by our culture and the cultural forces around us, which includes our political moment and includes our engagement with social media, as you alluded to. So I think it does take intentionality in thinking about how to inhabit this space differently. There's an urgency to this moment in part because the election is coming up. And I know for some, some of our students, this will be their first election. Um, and then there's all that's going on in the cultural moment, some of which has been building for a long time and does require attention. But in terms of a posture within that, how to, how to be people of hope more than despair and patience more than fear, I do think, and it sounds so simplistic, but Sabbath practices can be really important. In my, in my earlier work on justice, you know, we were kind of looking at, okay, what would we encourage in our callings to seek justice as disciples? you know, start with scripture, but then right away we say, practice Sabbath, which seems so counterintuitive because the needs of the world are, are real and, and feel urgent. I think similarly to how our political moment feels urgent, but Sabbath practice can, rem can build in that, that reminder that, that God is reigning. This is God's world and Christ is King and he is at work and the spirit is continuing to make all things new and it's not dependent on our work. So being able to step back and also because we're so quick to think we, we know the answer to also step back and, and with worship as a part of our Sabbath practice, be invited into um, the wisdom of our faith community, the wisdom that comes from preaching, from the Bible to try to see the world as God sees it. And through our, through our practices, um, of worship and gathering with God's people to be reminded, though though the voices outside and the chaos seems more real, actually the most real word, world is the kingdom of God. <laughs> the kingdom of God is at hand, right? Going back to John the Baptist, and it is here, and we have to, we do have to work at times and with God's help to see it. 
And as part of that, I think we could say more about um, how baptism and the Lord's Supper kind of can reorient us to, to think about our identity. We're baptized into one body and that crosses ethnic and religious, uh, sorry, ethnic and racial divides and helps us uh, by God's grace, be more aware of our, the unity we share in Christ. Um, I also do want to mention and suggest as part of that Sabbath, a technology fast or a technology Sabbath taking at least one day a week to step back and quiet those voices and remember who you are in Christ outside of those voices. And remember again, that kind of that very real reality of God, God's kingdom. And to just remember what it's like, maybe, you know, to go out into God's creation would be another Sabbath practice. And you kind of still the outside voices and try to be attentive to, to God, God's work in creation, God nourishing us um, through being in creation. I think the last thing I want to say is lament is really important. And I know that N.T. Wright spoke about this in, in his address, but there is a lot to grieve in this cultural moment. Mm -hmm. And to, to pause to name that, to name the places we see the brokenness, that we feel the weight of the division, that we see our brothers and sisters hurting, even if we can't fully understand, and to lament that and to go to scripture and the Psalms with, with their righteous anger and their righteous protest and their why God, and to allow that to be part of our faith offering is really important. I haven't gotten to place yet though. So those are still on the practices. So on the importance of place, part of why I emphasize that is I think coming out of my own story, I think being in DC, becoming a Christian in DC, there was such, I really inhabited this kind of change the world as a Christian and big picture thinking. And, and it, it's taken time and um, God at work at me through no novels like Middlemarch, if you haven't read it, to really kind of come down to we're each called to a specific location. And that doesn't mean ignore the big picture and God's wider world outside of the US as well, but how do we be attentive to right where we are and, and have the eyes to see what's going on right where we are? It's really easy to live, especially with technology, social media enabling us to be so attuned to what's going on out there, to have the discipline to be attentive to what's going on right here is something that I've had to work at and, and figure out right in my town of Holland, Michigan, through my kids' school engagement, through what I'm in, in the relationships I'm interacting with in my community, what are the needs right here? And that it is as meaningful to engage right here as it is to have um, kind of our, our platforms in our engagement domestically and internationally. There's a lot more we could say there. <laughs> You talked about how um, rage and resentment have become such a motivator in contemporary politics. And you mentioned how a lot of people have this warrior mentality. And I think we all kind of see that. What can we do if we're, if we're trying to have a conversation, trying to learn across the differences like you talk about, but you sort of are encountering someone with that warrior mentality? What are some ways that we can kind of try to engage in the midst of that? Or can we engage that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course it's, it's, I want to say it's easier. It's not always easy, but easier to, to be, to own our own postures, right? right? But when the mode that's been set is in a certain way that mitigates against that, what do we do? Um, I think it's important to name here that, that another part of our reality right now is that we, we don't interact with people who are different very regularly. And that's something that political scientists and sociologists have been observing as well. And um, out, of, out of political science, these, these terms of bridging and bonding, um, I find helpful that bonding trust is sort of bonding capital, what you need within a group to be bonded. But, but probably what, what we need as a culture right now is sort of bridging trust. How do we move from one group to another? And, and where are those bridges? And it's, it takes a lot of intentionality, just like I said, being rooted in a particular place, like being intentional about moving beyond. And, um, and I think what this, what the social science is revealing is that like small, small movements outside your group and then back can actually be worse because they can reinforce your stereotypes or reinforce that sense of um, 
in battlement. So like those long, the, the sustainable bridges, how to go about that. Honestly, I would love for everyone to give that some real thought because I think that is really one of the dilemmas of our age is where we can build in the kind of sustained interaction that enables the warrior posture to go down and the real interaction to go up. Um, and so there are organizations trying to cultivate that um, sort of more sustained interaction. And um, I think again, we're, you know, you know, trying to be intentional in how we structure our lives and our own pastures. And then some of those questions of when you encounter that fighting, instead of responding, reacting, kind of can you slow yourself down to ask what's beneath that? Why is there so much anger or fear here? And what is what feels at stake? And what's the positive love? Um, Augustine helps us think in terms of love. It's like, what's the positive love that, that they feel like they're losing or is threatened? And can I find a point of connection there um, that might help diffuse this moment? Those are those are some of my reflections there. Thanks. Yeah, that's great. Um, I want to sort of follow up on that question and spin a, a slightly different direction. Um, so you talked about lament and you pointed to the prophets who are characterized by righteous anger and um, spoke up, um, you know, because of injustices and so forth. So you know, how, how do you understand the difference between sort of righteous anger and having a prophetic voice and stoking division and undermining the common good? Because um, I think, especially from the perspective of marginalized communities, the idea is that if I'm being asked to just agree to disagree or to not think politics is a big deal, this is really just a trick for my grievances to be sidelined. I'm just being asked to cooperate for the common good when the common good hasn't done anything for my community. So that's, a, that's one that I really wrestle with, how you sort of know if you're being divisive versus being prophetic. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, mm -hmm. on that one. Yeah, I'm really grateful you asked that question. And as, as you noted, I also have been doing a lot of wrestling with that. I'm very aware of my own social location uh, as a white evangelical who has a certain amount of privilege in this conversation and, and thinking about it from certain lenses. So to some people, I do think, okay, versus like that from James, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry are really important, but that, I don't think we can say that easily or equally to everyone when we look at um, the realities and every culture has its own issues. We're focusing on the US context for these purposes, but you know, if we hone in there that there are, there are, there are legitimate generations long grievances. And to say to, in that instance, be quiet, um, listen better, does not seem right. The prophets, I mean, they they spoke very baldly, you know, and there is a place for the prophetic voice. And um, I suppose what if if you're if you find yourself listening to a prophetic voice and wanting them to be quiet, I suppose then I would ask. Um, ask you to think about, can, what can I learn from that prophetic voice? What might I not be seeing that maybe I need to see or hear or grapple with? And where can history help, help enlighten me? Um, because we are an ahistorical people. That is just one of the marks of, of U.S. culture. We don't think historically very easily. So I think it's hard for those of us for whom history has, has worked history and culture have kind of worked to our benefit um, to be aware of how other people have inhabited the very same society and experienced the very same history. So I know there's an old, there's an old um, proverb about sort of a rabbi saying everyone should have two pieces of paper. Maybe it's not too old because obviously we didn't always have pieces of paper, but have, have, have at the tip of your tongue sort of two different, you know, for one, you need to be reminded you were fearfully and wonderfully made. And then the other, you need to be reminded from dust you were made to dust you shall return. And like different moments call for different biblical reminders. And so how can we hold um, these different passages together that, that there is a place for righteous anger because God designed the world to, for everyone to flourish. And where people are not flourishing, that does need to be named. 
And in fact, the, I mean, some of the prophets and the psalmists, they're praying for God to come in his righteousness and avenge the injustice, the oppression. And there is definitely a, a moment for that. And we need to be open to that. And there is also um, consistently the thread of God himself is slow to anger and quick to listen and full of compassion and that that's part of our calling as Christians as well. So holding those together and, and that's where the complexity comes in again, not, not inhabiting, there's, there's no simple answer in this cultural moment, um, but, how, but being willing to hold those together and learn from each other as we try to hold them together. Yeah, I think we've got time for probably like a couple more questions and then we should probably wrap up. Amy, did you want to go or did you want me to keep going? I can ask one more question. Yeah. Sure. So as you mentioned a few minutes ago, for many of our students, this is their first presidential election. What thoughts do you have for them as they, some of them may have already voted, but many of them still to vote. What should they think about as they approach this election? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I always want to, want to, go back to, to kind of the longer term tradition that these reminders from Augustine that though feel, things feel urgent, we are part of a long tradition that has grappled with a lot. And also the church has, has survived through a lot of different political arrangements. So there are shifts going on in our culture. That is part of what we're feeling and navigating. And that rightly brings fear and anxiety in the midst of that, what is it like to remember that our hope is not in a particular political arrangement or a particular elected official, but in Christ the King. And in the midst of that, to be wise stewards of the callings we have politically, uh, to remember that we, we will cast a vote, we need to cast a vote and to do that as thoughtfully as we can. And that we have you know, four more years as undergrads at Wheaton and a lifetime to continue the wrestling and that, that we need to do that, that there are things we need to really wrestle with. One thing we didn't, we, we haven't talked about as much, um, it's maybe a lot to bring up right here towards the end is, you know, kind of the single issue voting mentality. And that is something that, that did emerge again in the last you know, the last few decades as sort of this Christian call that, that to care politically is to care about particular issues. And I think many Christians are asking the question is, you know, how, is that the right way to go about it? Are there a, range, a wider range of issues to which we're called to attend? And even if we care about this issue, does that map neatly onto one political party or one elected official when you look at policy on the ground and what really impacts how things change? So being willing to to cast your vote and know that the wrestling can continue and to be seeking wise, informed conversation partners who can help you in that wrestling, including your professors and your classmates and other voices, um, perhaps particularly voices that are different than the ones you're used to listening to who might be able to help you see things differently. Great. Maybe just one last question. Um, so you talked about um, how since the 1970s and 80s, you have sort of the alignment of evangelicals with you know, particular partisan leanings um, and, and political parties and so forth. My experience with students right now is that they are very confused about their identity as evangelicals, that um, they thought evangelical just, well, if they knew what the term evangelical meant, they thought it just meant I believe in the Bible and in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and so forth. But what they see in the news is that evangelicalism has really become a partisan political term. And it makes them feel almost alienated or confused as to how to relate to the faith traditions from which they ra they're raised. Um, yeah, as they're speaking to first year Wheaton students, how would you advise them to sort of wrestle with a sense of confusion and alienation that they're experiencing between their faith convictions and um, their maybe distaste with the partisanship that they see in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. Oh, the term evangelical is such a complicated one. Um, you are right, your students are right that it has a very, very particular meaning in the media and in sort of popular conceptions. 
um, which those of us who study the history and the tradition would say that doesn't capture that doesn't capture all of it. Um, it goes it goes way back to um, to Luther it goes way 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 back to to the good news of the gospel, right? Um, and yet, as I mean, it's linked to the history I told, right? Because as this um, more traditional Christians kind of re-engaged politically in the 70s and 80s, it did catch a lot of people off guard and journalists and others, commentators were, were trying to make sense of it. And, um, and, you know, evangelical was the term used. And so it did get associated for some legitimate reasons with a political re-engagement. And as I noted, um, with some some maybe stronger fundamentalist underpinnings than some other forms of evangelical re-engagement with culture. So, you know, the history of fundamentalism and evangelicalism is in there, um, what it means to inhabit our callings politically is in there. And, and there, there are people, and, and I really love to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. I mean, there were, reasons why Christians thought we need to fight for certain things that we believe they matter to God. And this is again, part of, part of our response. Um, and yet there are others of us saying is fighting is that warrior mentality is that, does that match um, kind of really what we're called to? So I guess I, I guess I, there are so many people wrestling with it. There's not a neat answer. Um, there are conferences about it. There are books about it with everyone trying to grapple with this part of our tradition. Should we let the language go? Is it, is it become so problematic um, that it's not even helpful anymore because it's so conflated with um, certain things. I guess that's an, to me, another plug for the liberal arts, make the most of your time, study deeply, study the longer tradition, study the scriptures, grapple with your professors and with your roommates and, and kind of come, come to peace with, with, your convictions more than the labels. I guess I, what I don't, I don't love the, the throwing the baby out with the bathwater is like, I don't, I think it's all complexify <laughs> so much. And I do not want to see us um, leaving our convictions behind because of a label. So the mm -hmm. convictions of course, and who we are in Christ and God's callings upon us are more important than the label. Right. Well, thank you so much, Kristen. This is such an enriching conversation. Um, I think there's lots to talk about in, in follow-up conversations that students could have after this. And we really, really just appreciate your sharing your scholarship and your wisdom with us today. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate your questions and the invitation to be with you all. God bless.